He is bachelor in astronomy at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Then he obtained his PhD in physics at uh, Stanford University, where he studied the bacterial cell cycle. Uh, then after graduation, he did a postdoc uh, with Ori Bargman at uh, Rockefeller University. And now he is an associate professor at the Georgia Tech School of Biological Sciences. His work integrates computational biology, genomics methods, um, and he seeks to understand uh, the evolution of behavior. And today he's going to tell us about the analysis of social behavior in Lake Malawi cichlids using automated behavior phenotyping. And I hope I pronounced the species correctly. Uh, Patrick, we're very excited to have you. Please take it away. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, yep, so uh, we work um, at uh, Georgia Tech, and this is a relatively new project for us. Um, when I came here, we were working primarily on C. elegans as a model organism. Um, that's the training that I got as a postdoc in Corey Bargman's lab. Uh, but since I moved here, um, I've started collaborating a lot with the Streelman lab, Todd Streelman's lab. And this is kind of a summary on some of that work that we've done since, since I've come here. And we're interested in understanding the evolution of behavior. Um, so a lot of the work that we've done is to look at C. elegans and understand how its behavior evolves. And C. elegans is a really powerful genetic system. So this allows us to get to the actual genetic changes that are responsible for behavioral evolution. Um, but we'd really like to be able to do this in a in a higher organism, um, some sort of vertebrate, um, because that gets us access to a lot more interesting behaviors, uh, like social behaviors. And you know, it's it's really pretty amazing how quickly um, you can evolve new behaviors. And I think a really elegant example of that is in domesticated foxes. Uh, so about 40 years ago, 40 generations ago, um, an experiment was started where uh, foxes were bred to either be aggressive or tame. Um, so each generation, the most aggressive foxes were chosen to breed the next generation, and the most tame foxes were, were kept to breed the next generation. And it's really remarkable how separate these behaviors are. And so on the left-hand side, you see a fox that has been bred to be aggressive, and as the human approaches uh, the fox, the fox takes on this very characteristic, uh, you know, look of "don't mess with me," and uh, you know, it's willing to bite, it's willing to to attack, and that is because these genetic variants um, that normally segregate within a population, if you if you select on them and if you accumulate enough of them, you can really pretty dramatically change their behavior. On the right, we can see the, the tame fox and the, what happens when the human approaches is, you know, completely opposite. The fox is not afraid of the human. You know, the fox jumps up and wants to play with the human. And again, that is just because it's accumulated a large number of genetic variants that has changed its brain in such a way that, you know, it no longer views humans as, as uh, someone, someone to be worried about, someone, to, someone, you know, to try to be aggressive with. So, and you can also see this um, in natural species. So this is not just like some sort of artifact of artificial selection. Um, you know, social behaviors change very rapidly. They're one of the behaviors that change the most. Um, and an example of this is in poison frogs and parental behavior. Um, so various species of poison frogs have very dramatic differences in the amount of, of parental behavior they provide to tadpoles. And uh, this is, you know, just one really cool example. There's all sorts of examples of changes in parental behavior or social behavior. Um, but in this case, you know, whether or not the, the frog provides parental behavior and brings food to the tadpoles. And um, this can either be by the mother or the father. Um, this is also a very evolutionary labile feature of the frog evolution where in some species it's the father that provides the parental behavior and the other species it's the mother. And this is also associated with changes in tadpole social behavior, whether they're social with, with their siblings or whether they um, take on this cannibalistic behavior where they actually try to eat um, other, other tadpoles within their, their small pool of water. 
So we study this in Lake Malawi cichlids. So Lake Malawi cichlids is probably the most powerful model to understand speciation in a vertebrate animal. And they're actually a large number of species um, across the world. So there's about 2,000 to 3,000 species, and that represents approximately 5% of the extant vertebrates um, that are currently alive. Um, this includes food fishes like tilapia um, that you might eat, um, and also aquarium species. Um, angelfish and oscars are, are kind of common examples um, of cichlids, but really there's a, there's a whole industry that revolves around um, using cichlids as, as aquarium fishes. Um, so they evolve pretty rapidly all over the world, but it's most pronounced in three lakes in um, the East African Rift region. And so um, this map, this map right here, um, shows you the location um, of those three lakes. And if we blow up into that region, we see this Lake Victoria on the top, Lake Tanganyika in the middle, and then the southernmost lake is Lake Malawi. And these lakes are not connected currently by river systems, but they're thought to be connected during periods of flooding. So um, historically, these lakes have been connected um, by, by water flow between these. And so we focus on Lake Malawi, and this is, um, this is what the Streelman lab has focused on um, for, for his entire time. Um, and so we have jumped on to, to, to using this really powerful, cool system um, using Lake Malawi cichlids. So Lake Malawi is a dynamic, recently formed lake. It uh, is a rift basin formed about 8.6 million years ago. Um, so this really deep, you know, it goes down to, to approximately 800 meters in different parts of the lake. Um, and this initial rift formed about 8.6 million years ago. And then deep water conditions occurred about four and a half million years ago when water was actually able to accumulate to a really high level. Um, but this lake is not just as simple as it formed, you know, one, four and a half million years ago, but it really has a very dynamic cycle in the exact um, lake water levels. And this includes completely drying out periodically through its history. Um, so the most recent time that it's dried out was about 1.2 million years ago, and then deep water conditions reformed about 800,000 years ago. And this was actually correlated with a change in the basin um, to the northeast of this, um, where it was actually this, this part right here raised up. And so the water levels have fluctuated pretty substantially um, since then. And this can be seen using drill core. So if you do a core in the, in the center of the lake, um, because the bottom of the lake is so anoxic and there's so little um, movement of the water, you get a really nice settlement pattern at the bottom of the lakes. And so they're able to actually measure the lake water levels um, pretty powerfully um, using kind of common uh, ge uh, geological techniques. And so on top, you see the lake water level um, compared to the current lake. Um, so you can see this fluctuation of about 600 meters um, over time. And so this lake is, is in a current stable cycle. Um, so, so, you know, for the past um, 80,000 years, um, we've had a really high level of water. Um, and, uh, but this is not, this is not normal. Um, normally, you see these really big fluctuation in lake levels. And so it's thought that this is actually correlated with the eccentricity um, of the Earth's orbit. And so currently, we're in a very low period of, of a low eccentricity, and that leads to these stable high water conditions. And so from an evolutionary perspective, this presents a very interesting dynamic. So before 800,000 years ago, you had this um, very shallow basin and it's thought that water was actually able to flow from the lake um, through this northeastern river system, the Ruhuhu system, all the way to the Indian Ocean. And so this led to a very shallow, small lake, you know, part, part marshland, part shallow lake. And then once this raising occurred, then the outlet of the, of the river was now to the south in the Shire River. 
And so this allowed the, the deep water conditions to occur, but you had periods of, of deep water followed by periods of contraction of the lake levels. And so this is this interesting cycling system where you have diversification, the opportunity for the evolution of new species when the lake water is really high and stable. And then as the lake contracts, you have these extinction events and then also the opportunity for hybridization. So these species can actually breed together with each other. And so you create these brand new chimeric species that you normally see. And so this is what thoughts is thought to contribute to this rapid evolution, this rapid speciation. We're currently in a set in a in a time when um, diversification is very high, and so there's actually 800 species of cichlids, and it's really remarkable how different these species are um, if you look at them. So their color is very different, their size is very different, what they eat is very different, um, but remarkably you can actually breed them together, and they can actually have fertile offspring, um, and their genetic diversity is, you know, on the range of, of diversity between human individuals. So this is kind of why part of the reason it's such a powerful system um, and from a behavior perspective there's a lot of interesting behaviors that are actually very different among these species. So one obvious thing is mate choice. So if you're um, a new species, you know, part of the process of speciation is that you have to recognize and prefer to mate with members of your own species. And this is thought where the coloration helps come, come in, um, where it helps these fish actually, actually distinguish between different species um, that are surrounding by it. Um, so mate choice is obviously something that has to evolve very rapidly um, for the fish to recognize its own, its own species. Um, aggressive behaviors, so if you ever breed these in aquariums, you know, if you have multiple fish, very often they will attack each other and um, either kill each other or create like a really strong hierarchy where there's a dominant fish and a submissive fish. And this is um, especially true for um, the species that live over rock habitats. So these are called mabunas. And about half of the species in Lake Malawi live over these rock habitats and are very, very aggressive and territorial. Um, they also evolved sand, uh, sorry, sand-based mating rituals. Um, so these are bower, uh, these are called bowers. Um, so you might be familiar with the bowers that are built by birds to attract mates. Um, about half of the species of cichlids also build these sand bowers in order to attract female mates. Um, and then finally, parental behaviors. Uh, so these, these fish actually have a really strong behavior uh, parental behavior where the, the fish will protect the fry by holding the fry within their mouth. So initially they'll hold the eggs um, within their mouth and then once the eggs hatch, um, they will hold the fry in the mouth um, and then the fry can either swim, swim and try to find food, but then if there's any sort of startling um, reflex, they will immediately return to the safety of the, of the mother. And so we are gonna to focus today on one of these behaviors, this mating ritual called bower building. Um, and there's also really interesting, you know, associated with these, these uh, behavioral differences, there's also really interesting changes in the brain of the cichlids. And so you can even see this just upon the size of certain regions. Uh, so the Streelman lab has actually identified molecular causes of differences in the size of the telencephalon. Um, so this, this right here, you can see the telencephalon from one of the species of fish, and it's obviously much larger than the telencephalon um, relative to the, to the overall brain size. Um, so we not only see really interesting changes in cell type, but even the whole size of, of brain regions is actually very labile. So kind of in combination, this, this makes cichlids a really powerful, interesting system. Um, so we can start to address what are the genetic variants that are responsible for differences in behavior, and then what are the changes in the neural circuits that are responsible for these differences in behavior. And so those are kind of the, the questions that drive this, this project for us. And you can use techniques such as QTL mapping. Um, so because you can breed these species together, you can use mapping techniques to identify the genetic basis of trait differences. Um, the, there are certain labs that have also developed CRISPR-Cas9. So the Junty lab um, in Maryland has, has adopted CRISPR for use in, um, in, in 
uh, cichlids, not Lake Malawi cichlids, but um, uh, Statotilapia bertoni, which is a close relative of Lake Malawi cichlids. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement that we can use this system, this non-model organism system, but we can actually use um, CRISPR-Cas9 type techniques to do genetic um, analysis of, of traits. Um, and then, of course, single cell transcriptomics. This is a very new powerful technique um, that is also also being used in cichlids, um, specifically by the Streelman lab. And then kind of our con uh, contribution to this project right now has focused a lot on automated behavioral analysis to measure behavior. So these are examples of Bowers. And hopefully you can see this video. Um, this is a video of fish actually in the Lake Malawi, and so you can see the males will build their own unique bower. Um, so, uh, so you can see, you know, each of the males is building its own bower. And it does that by picking up sand in one location and spitting it out in another location. So the males are the very colorful blue fish. And so you see each, each one of the bowers has a male that's associated with it. And then you can also see female fish coming through. And so they are, they are going to make a choice about which male to mate with based upon information about this bower. So somehow, presumably, this bower confers information about how good of a mate this, this male would be. Um, how successful this male has been in, you know, eating food, et cetera. So this behavior, again, is evolutionary labile. So not all of the species of uh, cichlids in Lake Malawi will build these bowers. These are primarily built by this, the uh, benthic, um, benthic species of cichlids that live over sand substrate. Uh, about 400 species will build bowers, about 400 species won't build bowers. So one of the questions we can ask is, you know, what are the changes to the brain that allow for this, this construction behavior to occur? And what are the changes to the brain that allow us to link a construction be behavior to a social, a social cue, um, you know, such as mating? Uh, but there is also shape differences, so there's not only whether or not they build bowers, um, but there's also very interesting shapes that they will build. So it's thought that this perhaps contributes to speciation, so, so uh, males have to, have to also build the appropriate type of bower, and there's two primary types of bowers. There's pit bowers, so just like you would think, these are large um, excavations, um, to create a, 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 a pit. And then there's also castles, which we saw in that video, where they create these kind of large mounds of, of, of sand. So we can also ask, how do we change the brain in order to, to drive the male to build a different shape bower? And then how do we change the brain in order to drive the female to prefer a different bower type? So we can get these fish to build bowers in the lab. So if you take uh, a male and you provide the male with females and you provide with an appropriate type of sand, the male will actually build an appropriate shaped bower. And so we can actually start to analyze this behavior in the lab. This behavior though takes about 10 days to build. Um, it's very punctuated. So the male will build for part of the day and then not build for part of the day. And so it makes it a very difficult behavior to study because you have to look at these fish for about 10 days um, while this building occurs. And then also, also you, don't, you can't predict when the male might start building. And so this screams out to me as a great opportunity um, in order to bring in automated behavioral analysis in order to, to study this behavior. And so that's what we did. So we designed something that could be cheap and that could also be used at scale. So kind of one of the limitations is we had to, had to create something that could be used in an aquatic facility. So an aquatic facility is designed for raising fish. It's not raised, it's not designed for being convenient for doing behavior analysis. Um, so we had to kind of fit things in that were small and, can, and could, uh, and could um, work within this, this confines. 
Um, there's a large number of tanks, and so we also wanted something that we could scale to use on, on a large number of tanks. And currently we have about 24 of these setups downstairs, um, and these, these are all working and able to collect, uh, collect data from the cichlids. And so the way this works is that you have a Raspberry Pi. So this Raspberry Pi um, right here is a, is a small microcomputer. You can buy it for about $30. And it, it has RAM, it has um, CPU. And so it's, it's a pretty powerful, cheap device that we can use to collect data. And so there's two primary data streams that we collect. So one is depth sensor data. So this tells us how far away uh, the sand is from a from a fixed location. And so this allows us to characterize the shape of the bower. And then simultaneously, we also use a Pi cam in order to collect high definition video. This data is temporarily stored on a hard drive, an external hard drive, and then synced up to Dropbox um, where it can be analyzed. And so with all of the peripheral um, things that are needed in order to do this, this recording, um, it's about $300 per setup. And so we get about 10 hours a day of HD video. So whenever the lights are on, um, we are recording, and then we get about 24 hours a day of depth information. This data is then analyzed with custom software that we have built um, in order to analyze both streams of data. So this video right here is just gonna show you 10 days in the life of this fish that is building. So you can see the sand is two, two colors of two sand grains. So there's a dark and a light um, grain. So you see a nice contrast in the sand and you'll be able to see as the, it helps really see as the animal builds, um, you'll be able to see the shape of the bower. So on the left, you're gonna see um, one frame approximately every five minutes. And then on the right, that is our current depth um, information that we have. So this depth sensor is not perfect, so you're going to see there's noise in some features, especially where the depth sensor hits things like reflective objects, so like the sides of the aquarium um, and outside of the aquarium. But you can see that you get a really good picture, I think, of, of what this building looks like. And so you'll also notice that, you know, when at nighttime you can't see anything on the left. Um, but now you see that uh, it, we're starting to build. So already on this first day, we see that there was a little bit of building. Um, so this kind of yellow right here indicates the, the shape, current shape of the bower, and you can kind of see that reflected in the, in the RGB um, as well. Um, you see this top band and this bottom band, you see kind of like noisiness that kind of comes in and out. Um, so that typically gets filtered out of our um, analysis. And then the fish is building, and then it's also kind of moving the position of the bower. So it's slowly also changing its mind, kind of where exactly it wants its bower to be. So you see this bower both increase in size and then move um, to the left as the fish continues to build. All right, so this fish um, has continued to build, but I'm going to cut this video short. Um, but I think this hopefully gives you a good sense of the of the depth data that we receive. So cichlids will build species typical bowers in the lab. Uh, so we have tested Copetochromus virginalis um, and Trimetochromus intermedius, and these both build pit type bowers. Um, so if we just took take a 3D rendering of what it looks like, you see this night, nice pit um, that has been formed by the, these two species. Um, Machanga caniferus, uh, sorry, that's a misspelling. Machanga caniferus um, will build a castle. And so you see this nice castle type bower um, that is built. Um, so these fish have never, it's not a learned behavior. So these fish, you know, their parents have lived on glass bottom tanks um, all their lives. Uh, you know, these fish were not taught how to build it. This is just an innate behavior that the fish are able to do um, in a species typical fashion. All right, so we also were interested in, in identifying 
the so we so we have kind of the way I think about it is you know at any given time we have a picture of of what the bower looks like, um, but we're also interested in how it's constructed. So you know if you think about like a house, you know at any given time when you're building a house, we might have a picture of of the current structure of the house, but we also want to know what the work people are doing in order to build that house. And so that is where the HD video comes into play. So we want to analyze this for the fish behaviors that are necessary for building. And so one of the things you'll notice is that the fish is picking up sand in different parts and then it'll spit it out. So it's picking up there. And then right now you're going to see it spit um, that sand out kind of on the bower location. So somehow we need to be able to identify every single time the fish picks up sand and every single time the fish spits out sand. But that's very difficult as hopefully you can see, you know, these, these are very subtle movements that the fish is making in order to, to pick up sand and, and spit it out. And there's hours of video to analyze. So 24 setups, 10 hours a day. Um, it's a very complex background. Um, so, you know, maybe if you're used to image analysis, you know, you try to have some grayscale background. Um, but in this case, we need to use this specific type of sand in order to get them to build. And so that creates a very complex background that makes it difficult to pull the fish out. So, One of the things we noticed in order to do this, to make this analysis possible, was that uh, we could take advantage of this complex sand colored background. And hopefully what you can notice is that, so I'm looping this video kind of over and over, but hopefully you can notice the fact that the sand distribution changes when the, when the fish picks it up. So very subtle movement of the fish, but very strong effect on the sand distribution. So everywhere that the, the fish does not pick up the sand, you see the pattern remains the same. But where the fish has picked up sand, we have a pretty dramatic change in the pattern of the sand coloring. And so this made us think maybe we could use this in order to actually identify, automatically identify every single time sand manipulation occurs. And so we, we use a hidden Markov model combined with spatial clustering. And this allows us to focus on sand changing events to know when, whenever they happen. And so this is just a image, a successive time series image of when the fish has picked up sand. And we're focusing on two different regions. This blue box shows you where the sand was picked up and the black box shows you an outer location which was not manipulated. And so if you look at the uh, distribution of, of sand before and after the event, the blue box has changed where the black box largely remains the same. So there's this tra transient change when the fish swims over it, but the sand distribution goes back to normal. And so if we look at a single pixel and a time series of a single pixel, we see that there is this fluctuation around specific values. Um, so this blue line is the raw data. The orange is, is kind of a, a filtered version of that. And then you can see how we fit, we fit a hidden Markov model. And so every time this green line changes, it indicates that there's been some sort of manipulation of sand within that pixel. And so we can cluster all of those events together. So all of these, these pixels that have changed have been clustered together into a single event that we can now create a movie clip around. So this focusing will create approximately 100,000 clusters for each 10 hour video. So there's a whole bunch of sand manipulation that is occurring. And this shows us some clips that we've taken. Um, so the spit clips are on the left, um, the scoop uh, clips are on the right. And so somehow we needed to then classify these videos into the correct category, um, whether or not building spit has occurred or a, or a, a building scoop has, has occurred. And, uh, you know, there's not an obvious way to do that. Um, you know, you can kind of see that when the fish spits, you see the sand kind of disperse in this cloudy way, but there wasn't any obvious criteria that we can use to distinguish it. And we also had to worry about other types of manipulation like fin swipes, et cetera. And so this is where we used uh, machine learning, so deep learning, 
And so we took advantage of um, the publication of a 3D um, CNN that could process volumetric data. So this can either uh, classify um, volumetric data like uh, um, like a scan of a body where you have three t three dimensional spatial data, um, or it can also be used to you on videos which have 2D spatial behavior and then a time series dimension. And so that's also an example of kind of like a 3D volume of data. And so these, these you know, are kind of magical. Um, it's pretty amazing how well they worked, um, but the key to their success is that you have a really good training set. And so this is, uh, this is why we were able to successfully use this 3D ResNet in order to classify all of these events. And so this was actually a really heroic effort by Zach Johnson, um, the postdoc that uh, uh, worked on this project, works on this project. And then my grad student, Li Zhang Long, um, used this data in order to train this network. And so Zach came up with 10 different uh, categories. Um, so there was three building categories. So this was either a building scoop, a building spit, or a building multiple. Um, and he also noticed that the fish would also manipulate sand during feeding. And so males might do that or the females might as well. And so he figured out that he could um, distinguish between these different behaviors. And so he actually classified these separately. So he has a building scoop category that occurs when the male is trying to build and then a feeding scoop category when, the, when either a male or a female is trying to scoop up um, sand in order to feed, to like, you know, um, filter out um, algae or you know some other biological material um, from from the sand um, and then he also found times when spawning occurred um, high sand drop reflections and then thin body manipulation of the sand so there was 10 different categories and there was over 14,000 videos that he looked at and, and categorized this way and so you can see overall our, our accuracy on the right. Um, so this is a confusion matrix that shows the predicted label on the top and then the human label on the left. And so we, we can see that the accuracy of this is pretty high, you know, almost 80% accurate. So four out of five of these uh, are classified correctly. Um, whereas if you would just look by chance, it would be more uh, along the lines of between 10 and 20%. And pretty much all of these categories um, were pretty accurate. The one exception was build multiple, which was 53%. And that was just because there's very few of these events. Um, so very rarely were two events captured by a single cluster. Um, really cool, you can see the spawning behavior of these fish. Uh, so the, uh, um, the, the way at the end um, for reproduction to occur, uh, the male and female do this cool little dance. So the male is is quivering. It's called quivering behavior, where he's kind of like uh, moving its his tail very quickly. And the female is looking at one of the fins um, that has these little spots on it. And then she will actually mouth that spot, lay an egg that the male can fertilize. So we're actually able to use this approach to even identify when these spawning events were occurring, because as you can see, the, the, the rapid movement of the tail will actually um, modify the sand and, and, and cause changes in the sand. So now we have this integrated look at this building behavior. So on the top, you can see the depth changes. So the depth sensor shows the daily depth changes. So the top is the total shape of the bower. And then the second row gives us how much it's changed over the course of 24 hours over that day. And then from the analysis of the video, we have all of these different building spit and scoop events um, that occurred. So now we have access, for example, to the visual stimulus that the fish had seen that caused it to, to, to scoop up sand and then um, spit it back out. And again, we have 10 different temporal categories. So we also have information about feeding um, and spawning as well. Um, so, you know, we, we get this data, you know, for every single one of these, these setups. Um, so it's a really powerful uh, data source that we have. So, um, 
just a couple of examples of kind of where we're going with this data. Um, so two applications that are being used pretty for, for, for this is one is to do single nucleus RNA-seq. Um, so we can do this in both behaving and control animals. So we can actually collect the fish as they're building um, using this setup. So we know in real time how much building the animal has done in the past 90 minutes. And so, you know, we can collect the animals when they're, when they're actually um, in the process of building. And then we're also using this to do QTL mapping of bower shape. So this um, single nucleus transcriptomics, this is being done by Zach Johnson in the Streelman lab um, using these setups. And uh, they have collected approximately um, 20 of each of the animals, uh, 20 animals that are either behaving um, or control. And then from these animals, they collect the telencephalon. So they dissect the telencephalon out um, from each animal. And then they use this in order to do single nucleus RNA-seq. Um, so I'm guessing most of you probably have seen these plots, um, these UMAP plots um, that break this single nucleus uh, transcriptomics data into specific cell populations. Um, so they're getting some really nice cell populations from this data. And, you know, you can look at and compare, you know, expression of each gene um, within specific clusters. So this bottom graph shows you the specific clusters. And then on the bottom, you see the specific genes. And so you can actually compare the transcripts levels in either the behaving or the, um, the control animals. So now you can not only find the cell populations that are active, but you can also see are there transcriptomic changes that occur as a result of, of behavior. And you know, one of the really uh, cool things about this is that now we know so for these fish, we have a really good measurement of their behavior for those 90 minutes before um, they were actually sacrificed. And so there's variation, for example, in the amount of building that they did. So on this top, these are all the building events that occurred in the behaving versus the control animals. Um, and so you can see that there's a pretty big range in that. Um, and we also get a measurement of feeding. So how much feeding they have done um, in those previous nine, 90 minutes. Um, and then even spawning. So some of these animals actually perform um, a lot of spawning events um, during that time. And so we can also correlate the amount of building, the amount of spawning that occurred with, with, with these specific changes. And so they've done some really cool analysis so far. I'm not gonna you know, talk about it too much, but if you get a chance to see Zach Johnson uh, give a talk sometime, I highly recommend it. Um, he's got a lot of really cool data analysis that he's done. Um, but one of the things that they found is um, this uh, connection to neurogenesis. So the animals that are behaving have a very high level of aromatase um, in specific cell populations. And this is also linked to changes in neurogenesis markers um, in specific clusters. So for example, this cluster is, is, um, uh, is thought to contain the fish version of the hippocampus. Um, so there's this kind of cool connection between neurogenesis um, in regions of the brain that are presumably involved in spatial behaviors. And fundamentally what, what this behavior is, is a spatial behavior where the fish has to um, pick up sand from a very particular region and then spit it out in a very particular region. So, you know, we think that there's gonna be an interesting connection to, to, to spatial uh, parts of the brain. Um, the Streelman lab has also shown that, uh, has also done genomics to identify uh, genetic variation variation that's associated with the change in shape. Um, so I talked before, there's a pit and a castle um, type shape. And if you look at genetic variation that is linked um, to whether the animal builds a pit or a castle. So if you look at a, a survey of species, uh, you see a very interesting part of the genome um, that is, uh, chromosome 11. So chromosome 11 contains a large number of these regions. So potentially what we're seeing is an inversion. So the way um, the way the the way um, behavioral traits seem to evolve in other species sometimes involve supergenes, 
um, large regions of the genome that are linked together. And so potentially that is also what's going on here where you have this large region of the genome that is that contains things that are necessary for building either a pit um, or a castle type bower. And so we're using that to map bower building behavior in F2 animals. And so we hope to have that QTO mapping um, pretty soon to see if we can provide evidence that that region is actually associated uh, with, with um, the, sh the shape that the bower is. So with that, um, I would like to conclude. Um, so two people I should um, highlight for this work is Li Zhang Long. So he is a former grad student um, of the lab that has that has graduated. Um, he did the machine learning aspect of this project. And then Zach Johnson, a postdoc in the Streelman lab, and he was kind of responsible for overseeing this whole project um, and, and the huge team of people that worked on it. So this team includes a number of grad students, research technicians, undergrads, master students, um, and you know they all contributed in some powerful way to the project. Um, so with that, I thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, here's some applause from all of us. All right, so if you have questions, I think the best thing would be to just raise a hand. Uh, for those of you who don't know how to do that, you can, what is it? Um, you can go to the people tab and at the bottom there's a raise hand. Um, if you prefer to just type a question, you can also do that um, and I, then I'll read it out for you. Um, and maybe I can start with, with the first question. So this is really fascinating. I, I study humans, so um, I, you know, this is really far from my area. But I was wondering, um, so when when you're engaging in behavior, you know, you see neural changes and presumably you see some um, changes in gene expression. Are you able to sort of resolve the, the relationship there, um, like which comes first or, um, you know, is, and I don't even know if that makes sense, that, that kind of question of like which comes first, but like that, that relationship between uh, gene expression and, and, and a neuro uh, firing in these more complex organisms. Are you able to study that at all with, with this setup or? Yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Um, I mean, that's a very difficult question, I think, to know is what comes first, the transcriptional changes or the firing. And, you know, something like this can be more complicated in cichlids because potentially you also have neurogenesis. And so if the cell populations are also changing, then you're going to see something that looks potentially like transcriptional changes that's, that is actually development um, and differentiation kind of that, you're, that you might be seeing. Um, I know I think it's a fascinating question that would be great to, to, to try to tease apart. Yeah, in humans, we just ignore that because we don't have <laughs> Yeah. You know, we don't have gene expression on this kind of level. Um, well, this is where C. elegans can be a powerful model. Yes, yes for um, sure. Yep. Yeah. All right, while we're waiting for other questions, I, I, I'll ask one more. Um, so can you give us a little bit more of an idea of how the, um, the 3D ResNet works? Um, like, how, how, how do they incorporate the third dimension into the... I mean, you, you showed a picture, but I, I couldn't quite get the intuition of sort of how it works. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's essentially just matrix operations that you do. And so when it comes to images, you typically have a two-dimensional matrix. Um, you know, it might actually have color in it, information as well. So it might be a 3D uh, matrix um, because you also have an R channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And you're successively, successfully multiplying that image by other matrices. And um, in the end, you keep multiplying it until you only have the number of categories that you want. So you set up your matrices so that, that as you multiply them down, there's only the categories you want. 
And so the magic is in the training. So somehow the, the training allows you to at, to create values in the matrix that gives you the correct answer. So that when you multiply an image that has, uh, the, or if you multiply a video that is a spit, then by multiplying it by all these matrices, you end up in that final vector. The highest number is, is the category that counts for like the, the spit. Um, so there's not much fundamentally different between image processing, machine learning, and video processing. Uh, it's it's the shape of the data, like the the volume is is a little bit more pronounced in one of the directions, and uh, as a result, you have to have much smaller videos. Um, so one of the challenges is actually fitting all of the data into computer memory. So you can't, for example, take the entire video that's 10 hours long and try to analyze it this way because it would just be way larger than, than you could ever fit in, in learning. So the challenge right now to using this is to actually focus on the parts of the video that have interesting things happening um, because then you can create a small enough video clip in order to analyze it with this approach. That makes sense, thanks. Um, all right, so we have uh, a question from Shivesh. I don't know if you can see it on the chat. So yep. yeah, I'll so... read it quickly for, for everybody. I was wondering if you're also thinking about the neuron activities in the brain during the behavior. Can IEG or PRK, like in zebrafish, be used to mark cells active during behavior? Yep, and so that is what Zach has been doing, is looking at immediate early gene expression to identify cell populations that are active during building. Um, and he's actually also been able to find a, a, a large number of new markers by looking for things that are kind of correlated with that expression. Uh, but yeah, that's a really powerful thing that you can do with this single cell data. Ah. Right. Follow up. How do you control um, that? So that part is difficult. So it's known that you want to look about ninety. It, it, there, it's known that it takes about ninety minutes for these immediate early genes to turn on. Um, but potentially, we can take our data set and actually look at the behavior because there's variation in the animals that we that we collected in terms of like when they behaved and how much they behaved. So potentially there's an opportunity to correlate in these animals when behavior occurred with the gene expression changes to resolve some of this temporal aspect of the immediate early gene expression. So, but that's a challenging thing to do with this because it's a sacrifice, you sacrifice the animal. So that part is difficult about this approach. All right. And our questions. Or if you don't want to type it, you can just raise your hand. No. Well, thank you all for your attention. Yeah, well, thank you, Patrick. I, that was really wonderful. That, yeah, I, I think the your talk was just this combination of exactly what we're trying to, to achieve here with neuroscience and neuroengineering um, all in one. And this, this was just really great. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. All right. Bye, everybody.